artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Well, anyways, without further ado, let's get to our our guest. Um, and certainly, uh, before we start, I want to say a few little housekeeping kind of things. Um, Welcome everyone to the Alternative Art School Visiting Artists Talk. I'm Nato Thompson, founder, and this is my partner in crime at the school, Amber Emery. We are so thrilled to have all of you with us on this occasion. Just obviously, FYI, we have summer courses available. Take a look at them, take a class. Also, we need, I hate to be like this, but I've got to be like this. Please like everything we post out there. Uh, you know what they say on YouTube? My friend, my son watches YouTube all the time. He's like, smash that like button, subscribe. You know, he's always like, no matter what he says, I was like, smash that like button. Anyways, please like, comment on us. Engagement's a big deal for what we are. And we are digitally native. So that world of your, this community is what we got. You know, we're as good as what we got. So please do that. And Carrie, I noticed you've been like killing it. You're like a Twitter machine, PS. Uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to shout out uh, an experiment that came out of our class. I no one's here from it, but uh, we some they did a WhatsApp crew. Uh, Amber, do, can you talk about that briefly? Because it's like I've been following it on the WhatsApp. It's super awesome. Um, we've been posting about it on the social media. Uh, if you had joined by 10 a.m. on the day they started, you got to kind of see the story unravel of them talking about their arts connection with where they're from. And the exhibition's still unraveling. So they're posting um, this whole kind of story about their work in connection with land and place um, from Puerto Rico and South Africa between the two places. So, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. How dope is that? Tariq, how dope is that? It's a WhatsApp exhibition. How cool is a WhatsApp exhibition? Um, yeah, it's cool. So we can all join. You just you just put in your number, you get part of the crew, and you can just have art delights on your phone. Um, all right. So without further ado, our guest, um, Tarika Waters, one of Seattle Magazine's most influential artists of Yo! 2023, born in Richmond, Virginia, not exactly next door to Seattle. Uh, Tarika Waters' innovative practice masterfully commands space through a use of mixed media tableaus, paintings, photographs, film, and whimsical immersive installations. Her technicolor characterizations of multi-generational commercial references reclaim a sincere aesthetic steeped in effortless regality and pro proudly celebrated traditions. She's been um, exhibited in numerous galleries and featured in Rolling Stone, France, Madame Figaro magazines, many accolades and I should also say in 2012 she co-started a space called uh, Martyr Sauce and so she not only makes art but facilitates the art of others in the Seattle region and I'm also really excited to be working with Tarika at the Seattle Art Fair coming up this July but without further ado please join me in welcoming Tarika Waters. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I mean I can't say I'm I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to get my Zoom legs back together. Y'all meet like this all the time. Every time y'all meet, I'm still. That's all good. I mean, you know, I'll just say this, though, just to give you some context, Rika. So this school started during the pandemic. Yeah. And, you know, it was the basic idea of like, yo, how crazy is this? We can, uh, be no. art, we can make an artist community online and just be. And if you see, like, it's working artists at every different age group. And, right. you know, and it's it's an amazing little thing we got going. So it's really informal. And we like to hear right. from working artists that like are piecing this thing called an art life together. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. Okay, good. Well, I'm, I, I have remarks, um, formal remarks. I could go that route. Um, I think what I'm gonna do though is share my screen. I have images that I put Ooh. together. I like going more in the picture book realm than <laughs> just a bunch of talking. <laughs> so I'm going to do, and then a lot of my notes were from the pandemic. So I was in a different headspace then. So <laughs> it was so funny too, when you read back uh, previous talks, it's like, that's that's a little intense. Like we can kind of move on from that for now. Uh -huh. um, so let me uh, grab this screen sharing. 
Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm a multidisciplinary installation artist. Um, I did. I started Martyr Sauce here in Seattle um, about yeah, in 2012. So it's over a decade, a little bit. Um, and um, but a little bit of backstory first. Grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Um, <laughs> thought I hit you with the family pics. <laughs> to give you some context. So half of my childhood was spent in Richmond, Virginia. Um, uh, my mom was a single mom. Um, my dad, they married, divorced, and he was out doing his thing thing. Um, and so it was just my mom taking care of um, my sister and I. And uh, in a very modest neighborhood, blue collar working class um, neighborhood. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, grow up in a family full of artists. Her siblings were artists, um, um, then later on to turn to be really accomplished, um, artists in, in multiple fields. It wasn't, um, talked about in a way where, um, I, I had to think of it outside of myself as some other, you know, extension that I, or something that I couldn't attain. It was so matter of fact, like driving a bus you are an artist, you know, it was just, just randomness and how it all connected in my brain. So I never really took it that seriously. It was just something that I thought everybody could just naturally do. But, um, and just seeing just those dynamics and uh, the things that uh, were around, that's my dad at, um, coming, popping in. <laughs> we were always super excited to see him. He was like the rock star, which irritated my mother. Cause she was like, I'm, I'm the rock star. <laughs> But um, we adored him. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, my mom, it was, look, pull your weight. I don't have time for, you know, don't think that you're just going to uh, walk around and just live off of me and not do anything. Um, so it's a fun picture of me and my sister wanting to do dishes. And she getting a picture of that because soon after we hated doing dishes. Um <laughs> And just the products that were around, um, because we didn't have much, um, times of the year were really significant in our lives. Um, uh, and she would just move mountain and earth just to make sure we had things. So I never knew that we were poor or what our conditions were at the time because um, she was just a super superhero, especially around Christmas time. Um, uh, it's funny, we grew up, I grew up in the church um, my great grandfather died behind the pulpit preaching, which famously in Richmond, every pastor that I met that grew up in that neighborhood or was around in that particular neighborhood always wanted to die like my great grandfather died. They thought that no was That's awesome. going to die. You got to be done. You know, it was just too much. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, so the, but Christmas was a, a mainstay. So it was the, the, that was the year that we got all of our toys, all of the, the objects that we were going to be messing around with for the full year. So it's like, whatever you want, this is what you get. Um, and uh, between that and just the, the commercialism of just looking at different products and things that resonated and how these things were significant in my life to the things and the objects that were significant to my mother, and her peers, it, it just really, um, as I got older, I just started remembering more and more how these things were just constants. And then the stories uh, that anchored, him, anchored them were significant to me as well, or just became just something that stuck with me that could get me out of things. So um, this piece in particular, Quilted Northern, and I apologize for the audio, um, I, I had to figure out a way to create this pack of toilet paper um, and and try to kind of pull these elements together that were reminiscent of um, uh, my grandmother who um, would often uh, babysit uh, my sister and I uh, when my mother was working and um, and there was a lot of depression and sadness sometimes around her. And then there was also like that, those random levels of urgency in running errands. And she was a beautician. She did. <laughs> and it was really fascinating to me just as a little girl seeing her 
there were things that she was not going, she just didn't care. Like if she just rolled her hair and we had to run to the store, she would put that rain bonnet on, get in the car. I need a pack of cigarettes and I need a pack, you know, a pack of toilet paper. And at that time, they had toilet paper that came in all sorts of colors. <laughs> now I think they cause cancer in your buttocks. I don't think you can, uh, <laughs> they went away. Uh, but I was obsessed. I was obsessed. So much so that um, like my aunts and my next door neighbor, my mom wasn't into this too tough, but their bathrooms were like masterfully curated. Like whatever the color, you know, theme of that bathroom, everything from head to toe was that particular color. Um, and trying to figure out ways to, um, in my work, kind of have fun with the the parts that you know just there's just so much this we're just we come with a certain set of like everybody has good and bad in their life there's a lot of different levels and variations of what we're all mustering through and I wanted um through this work that I've um started to start pulling it in and kind of creating this um I always call it the proverbial elephant in the room. The thing that we don't talk about, um, it's like, it's okay, but remember this thing that, you know, kind of was around and it and it kind of shifts your way of, of processing your memories in a way that it could kind of temper some some things that um, might be uh, might be a bit bit uh, bit much for you to um, digest on your day to day. Um, Julia, um, came to me, um, during the pandemic, kind of similar to how this started. It was out of a need. It's like, if there's no beauty, create the beauty. Um, and it was, um, at the time I was, it was really dark at the start of the pandemic. Um, I had this exhibition that I was curating at the time that I definitely thought, should have been canned <laughs> because it was during lockdown, <laughs> during the height of the pandemic where everything was shut down, everything was closed. Um, and um, I, I wanted to um, try to find some light in this really weird um, situation that I was in. I was very grateful and fortunate to be able to be able to make work during this time, but at the same time, it was really odd that um, um, I had to try to pull from things that I did didn't know how to where to go. So I went a little further back before I was born and went into. Um, uh, I have oh I have my space blurred out, but um, I when I started when I had Martin Sauce um, Underground. I started this um, little mini museum called Miss Pam, Marta Sauce Pop Art Museum. And it was filled of different artifacts from um, the early 20s, 30s to uh, the late 90s. And they were basically things that um, everybody had in their house, but they were specifically Black um, to certain degrees either in the marketing or in um in just in just what they were but what was fun for me is when people would come and check it out everybody no matter who they were had something in their house no matter where they grew up and it was just really fascinating to have that connection especially being all the way here in um in Seattle and uh and so um during the pandemic I was like well let me attempt to make this lunchbox at Thermos. Uh, when Diane Carroll, um, who starred in Julia, passed away in 2018, I was looking for a doll to add to the collection. I was obsessed with Dynasty and uh, a different world and anything Diane Carroll. I was just like, she was everything to me. I came across the lunch, I came across the television show, had no idea about the television show, was never in syndication, like, you know, Good Times or, um, the Jeffersons are all in the family, which is, is wild to me. Um, and, and, uh, and, and during the pandemic, I just went down the rabbit hole of watching the show. I got the lunchbox and thermos like 2018, but I never really watched or 
found the show. Um, and it just reminded me a lot of, of my mom in a lot of ways. Julia was a single mom, recent single mom, relocated to LA with her young son. Um, and she's a, a registered, I mean, she's, well, she's a nurse and, uh, and it just felt like all of the pieces fit together, especially during the pandemic, to kind of pay an homage to essential workers, single mothers, especially during that time. I have older kids. I mean, my a uh, 21-year-old and 18-year-old, so I wasn't suffering like most parents were during that pandemic with little ones. It tried, I, I don't even know. Hats off I mean, to them. Tarika, I'm just going to say, too, just the school itself. Yeah. A lot of single mothers are, you know, or people with kids in the school itself so it's like uh it's it certainly touches upon something pretty dear to wear yeah and i mean and it was the the growing up my mother i had perfect attendance um and i thought i was special it wasn't my mother was not having me stay home unless i had the bubonic plague it was one of those like you were going to school i don't care if you're you're 99.9 you're fine go to school um so if I got to stay home from school, it was it was amazing. And the only thing that was on television was The Price is Right. So and just combining like we're all we're all we are we're staying home from school. We don't know how long with this pandemic and um, in connection with this. Uh, I, I just I just recently expanded Martin Sauce into the storefront um, space that I um, it would eventually become the larger version of this small uh, little museum that I started, Miss Pam, um, Martin Sauce Pop Art Museum. And so the vision for this was very much so in, in connection to The Price is Right. I wanted this, um, uh, this showroom feel like, um, and you have a new car, you know, that kind of <laughs> So I didn't want it to just be me, you know, laboring over making this giant lunchbox and thermos. I also wanted it to um, move. Um, so this is a bit of me uh, in the space, kind of getting re ready for this exhibition. I'm, I started an oil painting. Um, so graphically, and digitally, I'm I'm always old school with a lot of stuff. So, a lot of the panels I had to recreate. So the only way I knew how to do it was through oil painting, photographing it, putting it into Photoshop, and then digitally manipulating it so that it kind of it has that cohesive vintage vibe. Um, pulling in elements that um, were near and dear to me growing up. Uh, let me see. I think I have a screen blurt. Um, but this is the original. I never have the original in. But I hope this is a oh, look at Julia, just the only one that blurred out. Why is it? It won't show anyway. <laughs> so, but this is the, the model. Tariq, it looks amazing. It looks so good. Thanks. It was a lot. It was ridiculous. A lot of it looks like a ton of work too. It was a ton of work. Uh, my husband and I almost didn't make it. <laughs> we almost didn't make it. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot. It was the hardest thing, you know, because it's like you know, yeah, I can make a box. The hardest thing for me, and then I tell my kids when I'm teaching or my students, is if you can make a if you can draw a circle. If you can draw, you know, triangle, then you're you're on the right, you know, path. But that's been when I'm making these objects, I just start with the shape, you know, can what's the shape? The hardest thing, and hats off to the Swedes, I think just the the curves, because usually it, it was just trying to find wood. First, I was trying to figure out how to bend the wood. I didn't didn't really trust myself with any really heavy machinery that would you know I, so it was um, I found this um, particular piece of wood that that has slits you could create it if you have like a proper wood shop but then the you can bend and manipulate the wood um, so the thermos is wood and um, the lunchbox yeah everything is primarily wood um, the only printing place that was open during that time were banner companies like billboard banner companies so I was able to um, 
to get it printed all in one sheet and the lunchbox is roughly um it's like a it's like about six foot high and um about seven and a half eight feet wide and the lunchbox I did it to scale so that the lunchbox could fit in the lunch uh the thermos sorry could fit in the lunchbox um and that's all wood and that's that special wood that that curves around which was it was a lot um it was a lot but it was great. And then this motorized. So the motor at the base of the lunchbox is from a car dealership, like one of those showroom floor kind of vibes where they put the motor on the floor and then the Porsche is just going around in a circle, um, which was fun to find. Um, but just even, and it was a one and done. It wasn't like I could really um, figure out like the weight. So that was the trick. The trick was, you know, the materials that I would usually use to make it, um, the lunchbox and thermos would be too heavy. So I had to make sure that the materials with the, with the lunchbox were light enough so that once it's on, it could, the, the, the motor can support it without me having to regroup with no time. It's like, it's, it's too much. It was too much. Anyway, so it worked out. Uh, and it's one of my favorite pieces. This is cool. Um, <laughs> because of all of, all of my, um, it's really loud. Um, because of all of my, uh, this is, uh, it going down. But I got a crosswalk put in, Mar uh, in Pioneer Square. Um, it's been, um, this is Miss Pam. Uh, and I had to ham it up. So <laughs> just because. <laughs> is, she the, is she the 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 mascot for Miss Pam or is I have become like the yes, it's all it's become a whole thing. I think in the the self-portraiture work that I've done requires a lot. Um and that I'm getting in a in a particular type of drag to to, to capture a lot of the, the stories and um, uh, just the, just a certain a particular vibe. And that vibe takes time. It takes time to install extensions and get like, <laughs> and just get a look together and not knowing exactly when or where a lot of this stuff is gonna take place. I'll just get ready and be ready. And so I've just been having fun with just, this particular um, journey and that um, and uh, and so, but but to go back to the crosswalk a bit, um, the the um, the ask was from the city um, in Pioneer Square. It was something that wasn't particularly. It, it wasn't. It didn't look like it was going to ever happen. It was just let's just see if it if we could get it approved because it's um, Pioneer Square is the oldest neighborhood in Seattle, um, and his, it's historic. And anything permanent is a no go. They just it, they it's always been shot down. So it's kind of um, a tourist. It's one of the main centers of Seattle, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of it downtown. Is. Yeah. And it's the original art district. So the the art walk, they have the art walk in every city, you know, in America now, but Pioneer Square, legend has it, let them tell it, that they were the OGs, they were the first <laughs> to do the art walk. So that, you know, you would think there would be more of this type of thing there, but it, it they're very particular and everything is very precious. So um for me with this crosswalk um with martyr sauce in particular i've done it all in that space um it started as a small like little stairway gallery expanded into this underground um kind of tavernous uh kind of hang where i just like the vibe and people coming in listening to music and then i had this unused space that I just turned into um, a beauty supply store and it was very particular um wasn't like your standard beauty supply store you can find any and everything um but it was specialized and very boutique-y and um and and just pushing and, and making sure that the conversation was such where we're talking about 
representation or equity or anything or types of ownerships in 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 Seattle at you know, and even in, in Seattle at large, especially during that time. Um, that you know, for me, it was I am here. This is these things are of value to me and have been of value to me my whole life, and and it's needed. It would be nice to see more of this reflected in you know more parts of the city. Um, that's not specific to like it doesn't have to exist only in a black neighborhood. You should not have to trek all the way down to you know wherever. It should be accessible if you're coming off you know home from work, or whatever. I'm here, um, but with the pandemic, with the pandemic, and even trying to and, and sustaining and and making it all work during. Um, during that time, it was, you, you, and you see businesses that were there for 20, you know, 30 plus years in that pandemic and a blinking of an eye go and leave. And for me, it was, you know, I don't know which way the wind is going to blow, but I do want to make sure that um, in doing something like this and creating a crosswalk, that it does represent a certain demographic that was there holding court uh, for <laughs> decades. So the the crosswalks, the crosswalk with the Afro pigs, I was really into just, you know, still am just, this is, you know, the white lines. How can I freak this and turn this into something um, design-wise that uh, will, uh, will be just, just fun to kind of manipulate and change. I wanted them to have a floating kind of vibe to it, um, but that's a traffic hazard so I couldn't do that uh, <laughs> so all these other regulations but it's cool it's fun it was a lot of fun to put together um and it got approved it took a while but it got it's there um which is cool so the something I, I'm just coming out of which is why I'm a little frazzled um <laughs> I just finished deinstalling this five room uh, immersive installation but um, Gum Baby, um, I've been working on this concept for a few years now. It kind of started with um, uh, just remembering Song of the South, <clears throat> the whole zippity doo da, zippity a, just in fragmented things. Like I was seeing it here and there. Um, I never, I think I saw it growing up, um, but it, it's funny, like back when it first came out, it was immediately canceled, which is great to see how, you know, we think we're doing something cute and new now. And it's like, all this stuff has been done. We've been having these conversations. Um, and for me growing up in the South, there was um, this, uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox. We call them, uh, I grew up calling them Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox. Um, and even with like Virginia Hamilton stories through the oral tradition, um, how uh, through circumstance and environment, how these stories change and evolve over time. Um, when my kids were little, I would read them uh, fables of uh, Anansi the Spider, um, Anansi the Spider-Man um, that came out of traditional West African culture. And there are the stories were very, were the same, were very similar. You have this trickster trying to get in and out of trouble. Um, and they're, they're set on quests or there's a task or there's a lesson to be learned here. Um, what was fascinating to me in dealing with uh, just Americana and all of these, um, these different narratives and things that we've been kind of spoon fed, especially in Black um, America, and especially growing up in the South, how these things just kind of become uh, either things to strive for or becomes like this narrative or this archetype or something to, to live by. Or, or, and even with generational trauma and pain, I, I can see even with my, my mom and my grandmothers and there are just these toxic traits that we just can't shake because we want to make sure that the fabric of our family is is intact, no matter even if it's really not, just how it appears, um, you know, out in the world is something that is is more valuable than what is what is actually the truth. Um, and I saw that with uh, Song of the South was really interesting in that there are these stories that are the same so Anansi this a story a story um 
has uh it's it's a really great read if you want to read a picture book um of Anansi the spider man so most times I'm reading the story to my kids it's a spider Anansi the spider man goes to see the sky god to get all of the stories um the sky god says you have to collect three things a leopard um a fairy and um a and a hornet and the hornets out of this hornet's nest and so Anansi the spider man goes off on this quest and when he um, goes to collect the the fairy. It's, uh, it's Mwati of the fairy that um, men never see. He uh, gets a wooden doll, covers it with white sticky paste and um, sets it down with a bowl of yams. Mwati comes out of hiding. She says, thank you, gum baby, and eats the yams. And then the gum baby, of course, doesn't say anything. And so she slaps the gum baby. My kids love that. She slapped the gum baby and got stuck. And she kept getting stuck. And um, that's how Anansi caught her. So then cut to a story, a story where um, Uncle Remus is telling the story of Br'er Rabbit. He's telling it now. It's just, just by oral tradition, it's, it's fascinating. These stories just either devolve in time, but or they become this that's just a circumstance of their environment. So now Br'er Rabbit is not a Nazi, <clears throat> excuse me. Uncle Remus is telling the story. So Br'er Rabbit is hopping along and he sees a tar baby, and tar baby is sitting there and and he says, How do you do? And the tar baby doesn't speak. And so Br'er Rabbit punches the tar baby. What's interesting is that the the, the rabbit is a rabbit and this tar baby is an actual it's it looks like a person you know um and it's you know it's and these stories were collected and then you know retold that was um they were documented um but you know how it's it's it was just a really interesting thing and and the the tar baby to the gum baby but the gum baby in particular is the the thing that I wanted to focus on I just felt like especially during um during the last few years I just kept getting stuck where I couldn't get out of this feeling that there there is something that I'm trying to express and no matter which angle I try to come at it with I'm going to lose this this fight I'm going to lose this conversation um because I'm not able to pull all the elements in and be hurt in in a way where it's it's beautiful it's you know it's great and then it's really dark and and scary and 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 that's what I saw with um, with Uncle Remus and, and A Story of Story was the first live action movie. Like, so when people think of Who Framed Roger Rabbit was actually um, a, song of, a song of the South and this really beautiful, these vibrant blues and pinks and um, birds coming out of nowhere singing to you, but it's, you know, they're on a plantation and they're singing and they're happy. It's like, nobody was happy. So it was the, and this is a part of American culture. This was, something that kids looked at and, and knew about. And we were, and, and regardless of how it got canceled, I still grew up singing zippity doo da zippity a, you know? So just how to pull those things together. So that was um, things that I was exploring with no. Um, and that was the first time I started uh, tackling also ball barrettes and kind of going to a specific time in my childhood where it was very impressionable, just a sponge soaking everything out, the good, the bad, and just trusting everything, everybody around me. And as a little girl, especially a little black girl growing up in the South, um, you are just, you do as you told, you keep your mouth shut, you don't say anything against anybody. So um, that's where um, during the pandemic, I just started um, creating all of these ball barrettes. And then with Gum Baby, it was important for me to uh, take these ball barrettes that I've been creating and turn them into glass. And in in changing the medium from you know clay and whatever kind of found stuff I could use to make those ball barrettes to actual glass and the fragility 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 of glass and um and these uh, these I mean ball barrettes are terrible if you know about them um <laughs> they're the worst uh, we had a bin it was a Saturday ritual. 
um, where, you know, my mom, that was our, our hair day. That was the day my mom had off of work. So it was get in the shower, get in the, you know, we're, I'm styling your hair, get the bin. So we had to get our hair washed and everything before Soul Train came on. So um, to capture like this mix of um, uh, just, uh, just with the, these ball barrettes, just thinking about that ritual of uh, sitting in between my mom's legs, all of the colors, my favorite colors, some not my favorite colors, the ones that got gross. Um, and then just the the routine of whatever you pick is what you're going to have to have throughout the week. So there was this level of like stress there. But um, and then there's just that imagination and play. Um, there was animations in its ex exhibition, um, five rooms. So it kind of, it takes you uh, through uh, multiple uh, realms, if you will. Um, glass was really fun to uh, to explore. <laughs> um, and these are a few images. This is a trailer uh, that I created um, I wanted to make sure that if you never got to see the exhibition, this was the best way that you got to experience it. Um, so it's easier for me to talk about it after you see most of it. So this is it. The, this is only two minutes. <laughs> That's great. So just a fun fact about that. Um, those are my kids. So <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I don't like to tell people that because I, I mean, in this cancel culture that we're in, I don't want <laughs> any of my stuff to follow them. But um, yeah, my son, um, he's the animator. So it was really kind of oh, fun, cool, that man. whole multi-generational. 
element and, and even trying to articulate a lot of what I've been trying to say, and I'm still working on it, obviously. Um, it was um, it was just a way to kind of uh, pull that in. And my daughter, who was the, the star of the show, um, is there are things that, you know, our experience is parallel. I think it's just kind of what it is, which you surround your kids with as well, that the things that bring you joy. But um, uh, yeah, so, and there were animations in the space. It's five rooms. It was just a raw space. So there's nothing in that space. It's 1,800 square feet of, of nothingness. So I wanted it to be uh, this kind of the storyboard um, version of an exhibition with a trick door was my whole thing. Like, how can I get people to walk through something that they weren't expecting to walk through? And then, so the white box gallery was the gag. People walk through the piece and then they're in, in this wonderland, so to speak. Hey, Tarika, I want to make sure we had time for people to ask questions too. Oh, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and congratulations on such an incredible show. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it goes without saying, you know, when I look at this work, I think I just think of all the hours of energy and enlisting the family. I'm sure you roped in a lot of folks to help you out with that project. Sure. Yeah. But it's yeah. a lot, you know, and that it's a five room installation. Clearly, you are meticulous about details. Yeah. Um, I, it shows. Yeah. Know. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll just, what, what, if you don't mind. Like, if you don't mind, can we stop sharing screen and we'll just go to that's the very great <clears throat> well first everybody let's give it up for tarika that works amazing oh yeah this works um i didn't know people had some questions there were certainly some comments uh, in here including um uh i think trisha said i remember the barrettes don't be tender-headed is what that's i said right. uh, <laughs> Uh, I think uh, um, uh, that she also said we did need a black Alice. That's a good point. Um, and then uh, Colette said very magical with elements of darkness. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, great stuff. Anybody have some questions or, or um, thoughts for Tarika? It takes a while for people to collect their, their thoughts. Hmm. It's all good. It's a lot. And I wasn't well, early. Listen, I mean, I have one, which is, you know, just as terms of an artist's life, you know, this is a school of working artists. And as we know, it's, it's, um, if you're doing it for the money, it really will uh, let you down. But if you're doing it for the joy and love, it can be a really great place uh, to experience life. How is it that, you know, you piece it all together, you know, um, Tarika? Because certainly, I mean, that show at Museum of Museums is a monster show. It was ridiculous. And the problem is Greg Lundgren. We have a shorthand for like crazy. <laughs> we were like, and then there's going to be a tunnel. So uh -huh. um, it's, no, I don't, no, that was why it was, um, it was a monster of a show. I think um, there was just a lot, like for me, it's all in the work. You know, I, I really love the whole Warhol approach. Like I, I don't really like talking too much about the work because it's just so much labor and time. And I've processed everything that I need, like the therapy and the work and the labor and the, and just producing it, I'm working through it. So by the time it's done, I'm just like, okay, it's done here. And then it's like, now speak. I'm like, I did done. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. With the installation, I just thought that um, that would be the best way to articulate it. And I wanted to feel what other people are feeling. So I, I know what I feel and I, and I love pop culture and I love those references. And I, and I'm very, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on a line with these brands because I don't like to change the brand because I want people to have that same like jolt of um, of a memory dopamine hit. Um, hopefully it's a good one, but I've heard some really not so good ones. Um, well, they'll start putting in their objects that um, bring up a certain thing. So, I mean, uh, I can't help but wonder, and it's probably something that like you said, it's hard for artists to answer this because probably in your disposition. But you know, a lot of the magic for me also comes in and just how tight the finishes are. I got a feeling you're pretty into the the details. Although I always feel like the people that are most into the details are 
think their work looks terrible, which makes them constantly like work constantly because yeah. yeah. it seems never finished. Uh, yeah. I got to like, you look, it's a little OCD ish, no offense. You know, like I, it, the verisimilitude of like the pop stuff is so yeah. striking. I mean, that lunchbox looked like a lunchbox. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I never felt like, I never felt like as an artist, I ever had the right to interpret. I thought I had to be as literal as possible. And I think, um, and then the thing was, in studying Warhol, even looking at Jeff Koons, I was like, wait, you know, how, how are you doing this? And then diving a little deeper and saying, oh, you have a lot of help doing that. And not having the help, not having the financial resources to be able to pull that together. My father was um, in construction. So I spent a lot of time on construction sites. I used to work on cars growing up. So being technically proficient, you, you had to, you know, is one of those things that if you, you can't prepare the radiator with the water bubble gum, you know, you need to take that out. You know, I could do, I could work on cars if it's 90, you know, 93 earlier you know I don't know even how to drive these new cars so <laughs> but there is something about um having to make sure that the work is sound and um and that part is also really interesting when I'm going into spaces and I'm talking about you know fabricating pieces um it's it's just more construction than anything it well, feels like the work yeah. shows I mean honestly it really it really makes it hum I mean it really comes through yeah. Anybody have some thoughts? Come on, chime in. Read in the comments. So now they'll come in. And um, I, Go ahead, I Carrie. Just, I really just liked um, how great your lunchbox and your thermos turned out. Like, I wish I could have seen it in person. Yeah, I have bits of it still hanging around. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really great. And it kind of, um, yeah, it was, um, it, you know, it hung out in the, in, in Miss Pam, it was in constant rotation. Um, and it got a bit of sun damage <laughs> over time, just in um, being in rotation. But I didn't want to move it or change it because of the nature of the neighborhood. At that time, it was bringing a lot of joy it, it just felt good like when people walk past if they couldn't access. And at that time it was, it was done because I didn't know if we were ever going to be able to see each other face to face again. So I wanted something, you know, from, you know, the street where people can engage with it walking by and it have that like price is right kind of showroom feel. So it's, you're engaging with the work without actually having to be physically in the space. Um, now, so, Rika uh, Margersauce also collaborates with other artists, right? It's a, it's a, yeah. you know, and, you know, it's always a mixed bag, though. You mentioned Warhol. Warhol seemed to be a, a vector of many things simultaneously, as right. I do. Yeah. Um, so you do part you collaborate and work with other artists through Margersauce, and, and then you have Tarika Waters, then you have Miss Pam, you have Margersauce. You have many identities, but they do different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I, um, yeah, and I've, yeah, it started and it, it was, you know, it's like physical brick and mortar gallery. So I would, um, you know, I didn't really know much about Seattle or Pioneer Square where we landed. We just found a space, this weird kooky space in the heart of uh, Pioneer Square and the Art Walk. Um, and I'm just a disruptor. So uh, and in talking to other artists, they were, you know, it's just like it's hard to get represented by this gallery or that gallery. And I'm like, well, they're all around me. So let's just do the damn thing and, <laughs> and say what, you know, <laughs> kind of. Um, and that was great. And it just took off. And um, and so, yeah, and and so with me, with artists in particular, burnout is real and then not feeling valued and it's just overworked and underpaid. And, you know, so I wouldn't, it became a thing where, you know, I understand the scene, the art scene and the, you know, we were doing the art walk and people come and drink your wine and all of that. But I want to make sure that I'm getting money into artists' hands. I don't care how small or how big. If I'm calling you, it's because I got a budget. I got some money for you, you know, and um, 
And so I've partnered with other institutions. So all, all of my curatorial work is out of museums and then, or they'll partner up. It's like, I like what you've done with Martin Sauce. Can you do it here? So that was um, my extension with STG, the Seattle Theater Company, working with the Paramount and um, starting a gallery there. And, um, and that had been going on for about five, six years. Uh, and, and then taking Martin Sauce from, and then with the pandemic, just constantly seeing a need to change as an artist and taking the brick and mortar concept into television where with film and television as well, it's, it's expensive, but um, I didn't wanna do a television show where I'm just calling people just say, hey, can I interview you? I wanted to do collaborative sketches and, and celebrate their work and showcase it in a really fun and whimsical way. Um, so, Similar to Pee Wee's Playhouse, I always throw that out there because of the work that I have that usually anchors as set design and just this weird wonky, you know, kind of vibe with a mix of solid gold and Arsenio Hall. It's all over the place because I don't want, I don't oh want. Oh my to God, the best what. description ever in the world ever just now. Yeah, so that, um, it airs on the Seattle, I got a distribution deal with the Seattle Channel. So that airs um, um, in front of Art Zone um, on Saturday evenings and um, but I do a quarterly, I'm a little over right now, but, um, uh, and, and it's been also, it started as a film. So it's touring as, uh, thank you. So it's called thank you, Miss Pam. And, um, it's shown at the Northwest film forum, uh, the, their film festival, um, Seattle black film festival. And then it's going to the Brooklyn, um, it's going to BAM and, um, in, J in June, August, June or August, I don't know. I thought it was June. I just got August. So I got to reread that email. Um, so it has legs and it's showcasing all sorts of creatives and small business owners was really important to feature as well as long as well as visual artists, musicians. So I, I, I love playing with artists. Like at this point, I just want to play. It's like, if I'm calling you, go into the playground. I want to turn to um, Cloudy's question. She says, can you say on the determination, resilience, and vision, what it takes, you make such great objects. How do you keep the energy going? And what happens to the objects afterwards? I don't know what to talk about. Well, um, <laughs> like, I can't well, even I, talk about what happens afterwards. I can't. I just had to destroy the television. Um, I just made this giant television for Gum Baby, and I, I didn't have a place to store it. So I had to take a hammer to it and destroy it. Um, but, um, the resilience, um, I think it's 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 making the choice. Like, you know, I think um, I, I want to stay in joy as much as possible. Like I had a lot of, you know, childhood traumas and things that, you know, and especially they resurfaced. And I was telling my mom, I said, why is this resurfacing so tough at 40? I said, this is like, like it's just yesterday. Like, why am I thinking about this in this way? And then we're all shell shocked. So every time I see people coming out, it's like we can feign like, you know, we haven't just all suffered through the same thing, but in any capacity, I'm seeing in everybody's face, like we're, we're a little shooketh. Um, so it's it's a way to kind of, and, and then with social media, because it's that, you know, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm, I'm just kind of straddling that before and, you know, and now we forget, we forget how significant things were and how much they meant to us. And so for me to take this nothing burger of a thing, and I love throwing to the ball barrettes because they were like, why, why that thing? But it says so much and it can, it can unpack so much with um, more than you, uh, more than you know. And then that thing that shouldn't have any significance, weight or value now has all the value and all the work. So just even to take that, those ball barrettes and to turn them into glass, like going into that medium, like as, glass has always terrified me. I've always like tapped my hat, my hat to like, you know, those cats and those hot, <laughs> it's just shattering. Like you just spent hours and now it's, and now it's done and we're, we're, we're fine with that. And they're like, yeah, we got to start over again. I'm like, <laughs> so to even go through that process it also kind of helps with the story and keeps it motivated if I can stay young in the work like there's always more to do and learn and you know and and that'll keep me from burning out but it's it's a lot of work regardless um so that's what 
Well, uh, the work is that. absolutely brilliant. It's such a joy to have you with us. You know, at the school, we always think like half of art is just being able to see what's in front of your face. Yeah. Creating it. Yeah. And certainly yeah. you brought the things that are in front of your face um, for your whole life into relief and appreciate it in a profound way. And the work is so refreshing in that regard. It gives truth to the prosaic magic that is our daily lives. I appreciate you, Tarika. And everybody, I don't know if you pop into Seattle. I don't even know if any of the ours are here in the Pacific Northwest, but Tarika's holding it down at Pioneer Square. And um, and I'm so glad to also introduce you, Tarika, to this great school. It's been a real kind of place of community during not just the pandemic, but I think life's alienating in general. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're, and so it's nice, you know, you thrive on artists. I think everyone else here does. So everyone, um, please join me in thanking Tarika for her generous use of her time. Oh, thank Thanks, you. Tarika. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's early for me. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> oh, you're awesome. It's been such a joy. You're great. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around